A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy, with justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. Our hope is in the Lord our God and in the one whom he has sent to be judge of the living and of the dead, the one who has come forth from Jesse and whose return in glory we even now await. Our hope may falter, but God never fails. He sends forth light to encourage us and to light our way as we await the fulfillment promises made to Israel and to all the earth. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for the light that you have sent and are sending into the world the light that even now lights our pathway. Honor us with your presence today and make your name known to all people. You are the potter and we are the clay. Form us as you will, Lord. Make our very lives songs of praise and adoration that will rise up to you, both now and forevermore. Amen. I invite you to please stand as we sing our hymn of praise. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. We will only sing verse 1 today. 274. <laughs> Sunday of Advent. For announcements this morning, I have one for mission committee members. Please stay after worship for a brief meeting. And then the Unity Prayer Watch, our day is January 17th, and there are still spots available, so sign up on the, for a time on the bulletin board. Are there any additional announcements? All right, we'll go to prayer concerns. As always, See the insert in your bulletin for your prayer concerns. And then, uh, does anybody have any prayer concerns they want to add? All right, let us pray. Dear Lord, you are our stronghold. The heavens declare your glory, and the skies display your craftsmanship. Thank you for your blessings upon our church, homes, and jobs. Holy Spirit, as blessing begins to overtake us, remind us to be a blessing to others. Amen. 
Okay, we're going to transition to the liturgy for Advent 1 on page 49. And in the middle of it, we'll also sing Come Along Expected Jesus, number 262. If you want to go to page 49 and then bookmark 262, we're going to switch back and forth. And then please stand. Shout for joy, you heavens. Rejoice, all the earth. The glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Rejoice greatly. Shout for joy. See, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and brings salvation. rescue us from our enemies and allow us to serve you without fear. So that we might be holy and righteous before you all the days of our lives. By your tender mercy you caused the bright dawn of salvation to rise on us. To give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. The voice of the messenger echoes from the desert calling us to prepare the way of the Lord and to make a straight path on which he may come. Let us confess our sins so that our crooked ways will be made straight and the rough ways smooth. You may be seated. Gracious Lord Jesus, you come to us with the good news of salvation, but too often we fail to notice. You come to us day by day, Yet we close the doors of our hearts when it seems convenient to do things our own way. We ignore your presence and your leadership. We have failed to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Forgive us, merciful Lord. May we live so that the world will know that you have come. Amen. Through John the Baptizer, we hear the Lord's promise, turn away from your sins and God will forgive your sins.
Eternal God, ruler of all ages, graciously you come to us in order that we might come to you through the merit of Jesus Christ, strengthened by the Holy Spirit. Help us and all your children to respond to the call of your gospel, faith, hope, and help. God of faith, you created humanity to serve and praise you, and even when we rebelled against you, you promised to send a Savior to redeem us from our sins. Strengthen our faith in your serving work through Christ, or as you chose the people of Israel to hear the promise of redemption through the prophets, may the people today believe in your good will for all that you have made. God of love, you fulfilled your promise of a redeemer in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Grant us the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that we may share your love with the sick and the afflicted, with the poor and the homeless, with the victims of injustice and discrimination, and with all who are experiencing times of trial. God of hope, you comfort us through our Savior's promise to return in glory at the end of time. As we await the coming of the Prince of Peace, let us not despair. We long for you to inspire all the nations and peoples of the world to turn to cooperation and nurture rather than to hatred and destruction. God of faith, love, and hope, to you and to you alone we pray. For you are our God, the only God, forever and ever. Amen. All right, please stand and turn to him 262. And if you want to hold your place on page 53, we'll be coming back there at the end. <laughs> page 53. Lord, you have kept the promise you made to our ancestors and have come to help the, and have come to the help of your servant people. You remember to show mercy to Abraham and Sarah and to all their descendants forever. We praise you, Lord. You are enthroned in glory, yet you came and continue to come for all who will receive you. We praise you for you are good and your mercy endures forever. To you be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. As you entered worship, 
You had the opportunity to give of your tithes and your offerings. Let us always remember that it is to God that we give our praises, our prayers, and our gifts. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious and almighty God, you are the giver of all things. You are the giver of abundance. Lord, you give us all that we need and more. So, Lord, today we thank you that we have the opportunity to give back. Lord, I pray that you will open up our hearts. And, Lord, that we might give. Not give out of our scarcity, but give out of our abundance. Lord, I pray that you will bless the giver. May each one give as they are able. For it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. transition our hearts into the hearing of God's holy word. Today our scripture text comes from Isaiah 2, 1 through 5, Psalms 122, Romans 13, 11 through 14, and the gospel of Matthew, Matthew 24, 36 through 44. Hear now the holy word of God. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, the Lord's future reign. 
This is a vision that Isaiah, son of Mazad, said concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of all, the most important place on earth. It will be raised above the other hills, and people from all over the world will stream there to worship. People from many nations will come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of Jacob's God. There he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the Lord's teaching will go out from Zion. His word will go out from Jerusalem. The Lord will meditate between nations and will settle settle international disputes. They will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will no longer fight against nation, nor train for war anymore. A warning of judgment. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Psalm 122. A song for pilgrims ascending to Jerusalem. A psalm of David. I was glad when they said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. And now here we are, standing inside your gates, old Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a well-built city. Its seamless walls cannot be breached. All the tribes of Israel, the Lord's people, make their pilgrimage here. They will come to give thanks to the name of the Lord, as the law requires of Israel. Here stands the thrones where judgment is given, the thrones of the dynasty of David. Pray for peace in Jerusalem. May all who love the city prosper. O Jerusalem, may there be peace within your walls and prosperity in your palaces. For the sake of my family and friends, I will say, may you have peace. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek what is best for you, O Jerusalem. From Romans chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. This is all the more urgent, for you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up, for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of living. Because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity and immoral living or in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't let yourself think about ways to indulge in your evil desires. And from Matthew chapters 24, verses 36 through 44. However, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. And those days before the flood... The people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Two men will be working in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know what day your Lord is coming. Understand this, if a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be ready all the time, for the Son of Man will come when least expected. May God bless the reading of his holy word, and may he give to each one of us clear understanding. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, every word in Scripture points us to your gift of hope through Christ Jesus. The Christmas story is not the beginning of your message of hope because the Old Testament is full of glimpses of your plan to redeem your people, to restore your people into relationship with you. 
as we experience Advent that leads us toward the Christmas story, we begin to see you and better understand your great love for us. Lord God, creator, maker of all, we gather today to worship you and praise you. Lord, we pray that you will be with us that you will con commune with us and fellowship with us as we on our journey toward the Christmas story. During Advent, let us have our time of fellowship with you. Help us to see the things that you would want us to see and prepare the way that you would want us to prepare. Nothing is too difficult for you. Nothing is too messy or too dirty for you because you, Jesus, came as the gift of eternal life. You came to put us into right relationship with the Father. Lord, we pray that we will, as we work our way through Advent, that our hearts will be changed this year and that we will look toward the hope that we have in you. Lord, we pray that as we hear your truth today, that you will reveal yourself to us in a greater way. Lord, I thank you for your truth. I thank you, Lord, for my voice and the ability that I have to speak your truth. Lord, I pray that you will fill my mouth with your message for your people. Lord, I will step aside as you speak to your people. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, the superintendent of a large Christian school was concerned about the disarray that he found in many of the classrooms. Probably some of you teachers could uh, attest to that and, and look and see how some of the classrooms are. Some of the desks, the way they are all organized and cluttered. Papers, he found, were often strewn on the floor everywhere. The students were surrounded by chaos. Feeling strongly that a suitable learning could only take place in a clean environment, he chose one classroom for an experiment. He came and introduced himself, and with a smile, he made this proposition to the students. Boys and girls, your teacher, principal, and I provide a well-equipped classroom for you. It's for you to be able to enjoy and to learn, and we expect it to be orderly. Many of you have crumpled papers in your desk with books left open and the pages bent. Often there are pencils on the floor, debris everywhere. I would like each of you to clean out your desk today and begin this school year with the neatest desk that you could possibly have. One day I will return and inspect your desk and the person with the neatest desk will receive this $100 bill, he said. I won't tell you which day it will be. It will be a surprise. Not even your teachers will know when I will be returning. The children got very excited and they began immediately. They were pulling out everything. They were cleaning their desks. They were filling the waste baskets full. Every morning for the first week, every student checked his or her desk to make sure it was perfect. The next week, a few boys grew a little weary of the exercise, and they returned to the former habits. By the third week, several students, girls and boys, remarked, I doubt if he'll ever come back. He just said that so we'd keep our desk clean. Basically, they all didn't believe that the superintendent would uh, return, except one little girl. She faithfully inspected her desk every morning, 
several times a day making sure that it was neat and everything was in the proper place. For months, she was teased by all the students. He's not coming back. Why do you keep looking for him? You look stupid, they said. Believe me, he is not coming back. Still, she remained quiet, kept her desk in perfect condition, and she continued to watch and wait. Near the end of the school year, there was a knock at the door. The superintendent entered. Quickly, the students flung open their desk and began to frantically clean. But the superintendent held up his hand and said, Stop. Stop right now. Step away from your desk. So all the students were caught with a messy desk. One after another, they gave excuses to the superintendent. You took too long to come back. The teacher should have warned us and told us. She didn't remind us. Boy, one little boy gave all kinds of excuses. And the little girl, she chimed in with him and said, Yeah, you're right. They should have told us. They should have warned us. They even blamed the superintendent. Well, finally, the superintendent, he arrived at the desk of the little girl, who confidently smiled. She displayed her well-kept desk to the superintendent. After inspecting her desk, he called her to the front of the room, and he awarded her the $100 bill. Boys and girls, he said, this girl never stopped believing. I would return, so she kept her desk in perfect order. She didn't worry about what day or when it would be. She continued to be prepared. So no matter what day I returned, it would be a clean desk. That's pretty much what we're dealing with here. Are we ready? Are we watchful? Is everything organized? Certainly not always organized. And around this time of the year, it seems like it's even more chaotic. More and more things are kind of out of order because you're pulling everything out to put and arrange everything and have it beautified for Christmas. And then you're going to put it back. And so it seems like it's kind of chaos. Well, Advent means something new is coming. And this something new leads us right up to Christmas. And when we think about it, I am reminded that, yes, we have Advent and we go right into Christmas. And we know that we realize that Jesus is coming. God with skin is coming into the world to be a part of our lives. Imagine that. We didn't know, we don't know, when he might return for us in his second coming. We don't know. I surely don't know. You don't know. Advent is a time that we would repent for our sins, that we would remember what it means for the, to have the gift of salvation, to remember and talk about, we talk about our candles and we light the Advent candles. And we have the candles of hope and peace and joy and love. And we celebrate all of this. And yet many times we find ourselves that we don't feel ready. We don't feel ready for the Lord's return. You know, this is the time of the year, and for those of you that don't know this, I follow the lectionary, so each week there's a new sermon, a new homily that needs to be done, things need to be changed, the bulletin and all, and so this year we'll, we're entering now a new year, which will be the year A. And when we do this, you'll also notice that during the different times and cycles we change the pyramids. We have blue now. So... Notice these things. A lot of people said, well, I never noticed those kind of things. But um, we follow the calendar, the lectionary calendar. And this leads us into different scriptures. And this way we continue to go through the Bible each year and we have different scriptures. We'll use different gospels. 
will use different portions from the Old Testament. And so it's important that we, I believe, notice those kind of things. Our gospel lesson today says, Therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. How many of us, when someone shows up and and we are not expecting them, and we're scrambling around thinking, oh my goodness, things are a wreck, you know, and uh, we're trying to get everything straight. So we're kind of like the boys and girls that when the superintendent showed back up. Well, we're like the little girl in our story. Watch and be prepared daily. We are to keep ourselves holy and righteous because we do not know the day nor the time when the Lord could return. (laughs) Martin Luther says, Drown your old self daily in the waters of baptism, and then rise up again as new, forgiven. A forgiven person living in God's grace. We live by God's grace. We are not perfect people. Some may tell you they're perfect, but I'm sorry they're not. There was only one perfect human being, and that perfect human being was Jesus Christ. Through baptism, we symbolically drowned ourselves of sins, drowned our sins, and we are raised to new life. Our sins are washed away, and we're to live a new life in Christ. What difference does baptism make to us? When Jesus was baptized, you remember what the Father spoke? You are my Son, the Beloved. My favor rests on you. Think about that. We are God's children too. And His favor rests on us. He loves us. He's proud of us. And he is with us in everything that we do. He's with us in our good times and the times that aren't so good. He's with us. Through baptism, we are all united. Scripture says in Galatians 3.28, There is no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. You are all one in Christ. We're all united. We're one in Christ. Think about that. It's like a little girl story. She was on a train, and I love this story. I'm visual, you know this, and that's one of the things that just gives me this visual story. The little girl was on a train going to London shortly after the Second World War. She had been evacuated from the city during the air raids and had not seen her mother for a long, long time. She was excited about their reunion. A fellow passenger negatively said, What if she does not recognize you? After all, it's been a long time since she's seen you. She may have forgotten what you look like. At first, the child was kind of shocked at what this person had said, the very idea that her mother would not recognize her. Well, she looked at the lady and she said, It's all right. She said, My mother made this dress that I have on. She'll recognize this dress. God will also know us. God will recognize us. And think about this. We'll be dressed in the white clothes of righteousness. God won't see the sin and the sinfulness. He will see us. And see us in our holy and righteous state. You remember each week I talk about how we are being changed from glory to glory to glory. When we receive Christ, and we accept him, we're forgiven of our sins. But God is not going to leave us the way we are. He's going to continue to change us from glory to glory to glory. 
Do you realize that you're different today than you were, say, last year? I would hope that you have a closer relationship with the Lord. I would hope that each day as the day goes by and the hours that you grow closer with the Lord and spend more time with Him. St. Augustine said, The church is not a hotel for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. C.S. Lewis said, A Christian is not one who never goes wrong, but one who is unable to repent and begin over and over again after he stumbles because of the inner workings of Christ. Abigail Van Buren said, The church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. If we're really honest with ourselves, we are all sinners saved by God's grace. Saved by His grace. Not in and of anything of ourselves, but saved by His grace. Well, many of you know I I love the Peanuts comment and strips and the different things and Charlie Brown and all the ones and one I remember, and some one might be familiar to you, is uh, is one that Lucy in the following Peanuts comic strip had. This we want to change, but cannot help ourselves. The story several years ago in the Peanuts comic strip, Lucy and Charlie Brown were practicing football. Lucy would hold the ball for Charlie, place so he could kick it, and then Charlie would kick the ball. But every time Lucy helped the ball for Charlie. He would approach the ball and kick it with all his might. But at the precise moment, on the point of no return, Lucy would pick up the ball and Charlie, in all momentum, would fall flat on his back. Well, Charlie was disappointed that Lucy would do that to him. Well, the comic strip opens again with Lucy holding the ball. But Charlie Brown would not kick the ball. Lucy begged him to kick the ball, but Lucy, but Charlie Brown said, every time I try to kick the ball, you remove it, and I fall flat on my back. They went back and forth for the longest time, and finally Lucy broke down in tears and admitted, Charlie Brown, I am so terribly sorry over all these years that I have picked on you and have picked up the football. I am sorry for this cruel trick. But I have seen the error of my ways, she said. I have seen the hurt that I have caused you. I've been wrong. Won't you please forgive a repentant girl, she said. Won't you give me another chance? Well, Charlie Brown was moved by this, we know. He couldn't stand to see Lucy so sad. And Lucy's disbelief of grief and responding to her, it just, he felt like she had had a change of heart. But we all know what happens. He stepped back as she held the ball and he ran. And at the last moment, Lucy picks up the ball and Charlie Brown falls flat on his back. Lucy's last words, recognizing your faults and actually changing your ways are two different things, Charlie Brown. How about you? You know, think about it. You respond or you say and you do something and you know you shouldn't do it, but you've repeatedly done it. And you tell people, well, I'm sorry. I really didn't mean to do that. But then the next time it comes around, you do the same thing again, just like Lucy. So we can learn a lot from this story. So really, Lucy, she recognized and she acknowledged her unkind behavior But she was not willing to change it. So there's a difference in recognizing that you are doing something wrong and making a change. A whole lot. So, you know, when we think about it, I realize that only God can change us. Only God's truth and his love can change us. 
and co- can truly change a heart. So when we think about that's why we need we need a Savior. We need a Redeemer. We need a Comforter. Jesus says, Therefore you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Jesus calls us to be watchful and ready and to really be waiting for him. You know, when we think about it and recognizing this point that we know that we do something we shouldn't do, but we do it anyway, many times, just like in the situation with Charlie Brown, Charlie Brown was hurt. He was hurt that his friend had deceived him. Maybe his back was even hurting. He had failed so many times. But he was forgiving. And he was going to give Lucy another chance. And is it that way with us? Are we for that forgiving with others? When we think about how others might treat us, are we forgiving? Do we forgive them? Do we recognize that we need to forgive them? You know, there's a difference in a sense of forgiving someone and really forgiving. Sometimes people say, well, I forgive you, but they hold on to the unforgiveness within them. God calls us to forgive all things. We're to forgive others the way that the Lord forgives us. And his grace is forever. It's endless. And he forgives us for everything. And are we always good? No, we're not. I'm sorry, we're not. But he still forgives us. And he still loves us. And he's still one day going to come back for us. You know, as we journey on through the next weeks of Advent, let this be a time that you can gather. Maybe gather with friends. Gather with family. Maybe be alone with God. But share with one another some of the things that you would like to maybe change in your life. That you would like to prepare yourself in a better way. New Year comes, we, people always have new goals that they want to accomplish. But I also think Advent could be a good time to do that. Things that maybe we would say, I would like to do this different. This year, I would like, by the time I reach Christmas morning, I want things to be so different in my life. I want to have drawn closer to my Savior. I hope that is your prayer today. That is, you wait and you watch and you prepare yourself that your desire is to be closer with your Savior. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Most merciful God, how grateful we are, Lord, that you do forgive us of our sins. And how grateful we are that you shed your light on our pathway and that you give us guidance on our spiritual journey. You guide us through the darkness of the world. And you help to steer our minds and our hearts and prepare them to be ready for your return. Lord, you call us to be holy and righteous. You call us to turn away from sin and prepare ourselves for your return. Forgive us, Lord, when we fall so short. Forgive us when we fail to heed your word to us. Forgive us, Lord, when we fail to spend the time with you that you would want us to spend, that you want us to come and fellowship with you to read your word, to pray. 
to look around and enjoy all the beauty of the earth that you have given us. To look around and see the many friends and family members that you have brought into our lives as gifts to each one of us. Forgive us, Lord, when we fail to be thankful as we should for all the things that you have done for us. Help us, Lord, to be more like Jesus. Lead and guide us in this journey of Advent. And Lord, make this the the most special Advent of ever in our lives. As we approach Christmas Day, Let us discover you in a new way and let you have more meaning in our lives. We love you, Lord. And Lord, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I invite you to please stand for our hymn of departure, The King Shall Come, hymn number 257 in your hymnal. Christ Jesus in the world that is so dark may you truly be ready